Hey, what's up out there, everybody? I hope you're all fantastic. This is episode four of my top 100 action movies from the 1990s. If you missed the first three, I will leave them linked in this video for you guys to check out later. Today, I'm diving into films number 70 through 61, a collection of movies that deliver a wide range of action-packed suspense from alien drug dealers to thrills on the river to a trip to the hockey game. This list has a little bit of everything, so let's dive into it and get things going. In at number 70 is an action thriller set on the river, centered on a burnt out cop assigned to river duty, but they shouldn't have put him in the water if they didn't want him to make some waves, and that's exactly what Bruce Willis does in 1993 Striking Distance, also starring Sarah Jessica Parker and Dennis Farina. Now this movie does have its flaws, front and center would be Sarah Jessica Parker and Bruce Willis lacking basically any chemistry at all. Willis also feels like he's mildly checked out and kind of just relying on borrowed character tropes to fill out this performance, but I still think the river element in the uh, family dynamics of striking distance create a, a history that builds an engaging lived in atmosphere for this story. It has strong elements of a mystery as the bodies keep piling up in the river and i think the supporting cast is very strong led by dennis farina this one certainly does go through the genre motions i won't deny that but the splashes of action ramp up the intensity when needed and the moody vibe of this film can really lure you in despite its predictability i mean striking distance is not flashy and it lacks a lot of charisma but the action is well staged, it's gritty enough, and the chase sequences, uh, both on the streets and out in the river, are adrenaline pumping, which does make this an unassumingly fun ride. Next up at number 69 is an underrated Jean-Claude Van Damme flick set at a hockey game. They said Game 7 would be a war, but they didn't know the half of it because terror is going into overtime in 1995's Sudden Death from director Peter Hyams, also starring the late great Powers Booth. I'm not going to sit here and argue that Sudden Death isn't a diehard retread. However, the timing of this plot with the progression of the hockey game is undeniably effective at ramping up the tension and keeping the pace moving and making this film so engaging the stadium is a fantastic playground for all the action and van damme is all over the building from the basement to the rooftop to the ice during the game and yes it's all admittedly a bit silly yet more than fun enough for a fast-paced thrill ride with van damme in the lead i think powers booth really does just take this generic role he completely sells it to make it the character his own and sure this movie is framed on borrowed elements but the hockey infusion makes it more than unique enough to stand on its own a sudden death would come towards the end of van damme's a-list run but the action holds up nicely for a turn your brain off adventure Moving along to number 68 is I think the first full-on buddy comedy to hit this list, and it's an iconic one when the East would team with the West, two cops, one that's all talk, the other's all action, and they would be Jackie Chan and Chris Tucker in 1998's Rush Hour. I would assume many would put this film higher up on their lists, and I certainly do enjoy this film, but the teaming up of Chan and Tucker just didn't grab me like they seemingly did for the rest of the world at the time. The humor in Rush Hour feels a bit one note, and it's more chuckle worthy than it is laughable, but I won't deny when the action kicks in, this movie is delightfully satisfying. Moments of action are humorous, others are suspenseful, and then the two tones, I think, really do complement one another well. I think Tucker gets his shots of action, but really, I mean, it's all fueled by the stunt work and the martial arts skill of Jackie Chan, because when Chan's doing his thing, this movie's a blast. The action set pieces, the choreography, they're all sound, and really this movie, for me at least, is just missing a charismatic villain. However, as it stands, Rush Hour is still a very strong film from the decade.
Now, my number 67 movie was heralded as the next great action adventure, and it was headlined by arguably the biggest action star in the world with Arnold Schwarzenegger when he would star in 1993's Last Action Hero, directed by John McTiernan. This is certainly a movie that has aged pretty well over time and garnered more appreciation over recent years. It's a far from a perfect flick, I won't tell you that, but I mean, you do have to kind of appreciate its ambitiously unique plot. Last Action Hero is an action movie inside of an action movie, and the meta layering and the over-the-top sequences are fun to watch. This film is filled with spectacle and dumb laughs, and I think it's all effective with Arnold behind the wheel showcasing his comedic chops while also reminding people why he is an action icon. I mean, sure, this movie gets dumb more often than not, but that's kind of the point. And seeing Arnold just parody the action genre that he helped build, it's uh, filled with all the massive action you would expect. And from the cameos to the stunt work to the ridiculous one liners and the scoring and the cartoonish villains, Last Action Hero is a timestamp to all the silliness that we loved from the action action genre. Written and directed by Tom Tykwer, my number 66 pick is probably the most unique film on this list as a young woman has just 20 minutes to come up with 100,000 Deutschmarks to save her boyfriend in the high-intensity action thriller Run Lola Run from 1998 starring Franca Potenz. While probably familiar with fans of the action genre, I would say this movie is a probably a bit forgotten amongst general audiences. However, it's one that I think still holds up great because of its high anxiety atmosphere and its ability to engage you in the character's decision making. Run Lola Run essentially plays out like three separate stories with their own endings that overlap and affect one another. This really adds a fun, heightened intrigue as to what's going to happen next and where things are going to go, which to be honest was a rarity and still really is a rarity in the action genre today. I think uh, Potent delivers a thrilling performance. She has all that needed layering and this film is just filled with practical action. It really gives this movie a sturdier layer of realism that's perfect for the tone of this plot and the visual look of this movie. Run Lola Nun may be a film that you have seen when scrolling through streamers and never really hit to play on, but I think once you do, it will sweep you up in the suspense and take you on a ride that you'll remember for quite some time. In at number 65 is another of those early in the decade action flicks that feels like it came from the 80s. It's centered on a Brooklyn cop avenging the death of his partner when Steven Seagal would be out for justice from director John Flynn, also starring William Forsythe. I would consider this to be Seagal's probably his most violent film. It's a mashup of tropes from the action genre, but the martial arts from Seagal and his over-enthusiastic gravitas just carries the appeal as he soaks up every scene of this film with his immaculate ponytail. The fight sequences are gritty and unrelenting, and this is another of Seagal's very early 90s action films that feels like it was pulled right out of 1985. But to me, though, the true star of Out for Justice is William Forsythe, who goes about as all in on a character as you can, and that's what you want from an action movie villain. He's no physical match for Seagal, but this film's villain through Forsythe's performance is completely unhinged, and it elevates the movie greatly. And I think with all the gunplay and the breaking bones and the bloody violence, Out for Justice is textbook early Seagal and still one of his best. In 1998, they said it was a lethal summer with my number 64 film, a feel-good curtain call for one of the truly great action franchises. I'm, of course, talking about Lethal Weapon 4 from director Richard Donner, starring Mel Gibson, Danny Glover, Rene Russo, Joe Pesci, Chris Rock, and Jet Li. Now, some people may not like this entry in the franchise as much as me, and I'll admit it's nowhere near the level of the first two, but I think Lethal Weapon 4, with its mildly cheesy focus on family and an added emphasis on humor, just sort of works for me. It's like Lethal Weapon meets Rush Hour, and the added comedy may not always be everybody's cup of tea, but it doesn't really undercut the suspense either. You got Gibson and Glover, who are great together once again, and then I think seeing them as aging cops does have 
have its spots of appeal, but I think what really makes this movie work so well is just the fantastic large scale action set pieces that rely on practical effects and old fashioned stunt work. The freeway sequence is just as awesome today visually and Jet Li's martial arts skills add a gritty element to this film as well. And it's just kind of nostalgic to see these characters in a more comical sense without forgetting the action roots and the buddy chemistry that made the franchise great. My number 63 film features a retired DEA agent who will take on a Jamaican drug lord. They attacked his family, they killed his partner, and they made the wrong guy very angry when Steven Seagal would be marked for death from 1990, also starring Keith David. I think everybody would agree that Seagal's first few movies were pretty much chopped and swapped pieces of the same story, yet Marked for Death works well for a few reasons. First, Keith David is a great sidekick. He elevates the film with his presence and his chemistry with Seagal, dials back uh, Seagal's kind of bravitas just a little bit. I think the action is really fun and hyper violent and well shot overall to showcase Seagal's fast paced fighting style and the villains. I mean, despite being overly stereotypical, are a viable menace for Seagal. I mean, it's led by the eccentric Screwface, who's a charming wild card. Mark for Death is really, again, a Seagal movie pulled right out of the 80s. It's gritty, it's unassumingly cheesy in places, and it just all gels together to deliver a quick moving action thriller that doesn't really do anything new but gives its lead plenty of opportunities to kill bad guys in a variety of ways and sometimes that's all you really want from an action film. Moving along to my number 62 film is another one written and directed by Luke Besson about the perfect assassin, an innocent witness, and a detective who took things way too far in 1994's The Professional, also known as Leon, starring Jean Renault, Natalie Portman, Gary Oldman, and Danny Aiello. Now, I assume many people would have this film higher up on their lists, and I do think it's a fantastic movie. I love it. I think the action when it hits is hyper violent and unyielding. The performances from Renault and Portman are also able to give their chance friendship and element of sincerity that you can't help but invest in. And Bisson's direction is some of his finest work with also Gary Oldman delivering an ultra sleazy role in the villain. He's just like his sadistic charisma is really just perfect for the needs of this story. And I think Oldman delivers one of the decade's most vile bad guys, but even though I do enjoy all the action and that I do think it's perfect for the needs of this film, The Professional for me plays more like a drama fueled with gritty suspense, and when sitting down for an action movie, this wouldn't necessarily be a title I would seek out. And in at 61 is a wildly fun action sci-fi thriller with a total 80s vibe to it. It stars uh, Dolph Lundgren as a Houston cop up against something that isn't human and Craig R. Baxley's I Come in Peace, also known as Dark Angel from 1990. Now this movie is pure 80s cheese and I love it. Dolph Lundgren is fantastic in the lead. This movie centers on, listen to this, an alien drug dealer coming to Earth to harvest a drug for his planet that comes from human bodies and it's as amazing as it is ridiculous. The alien essentially uses compact discs that shoot out of its arm to kill people and it's a riot of mindless action. Lundgren is delivering one-liners as this movie goes through the genre checklist but it's still a great time. It's unique despite its absurdity and it's filled with explosive action. I mean, they must have had a coupon for pyrotechnics because the slow mo Motion shots of characters running from massive explosions are plentiful and I Come in Peace is just mindlessly engaging because of how wildly out of the box it is and Matthias Hughes is great as the massive villain who comes in peace but eventually goes in pieces. And that wraps up this collection of 10 films guys number 70 through 61. These are without question many delightfully violent movies that are worth checking out if you haven't seen them. Again uh, if you did miss any of the past three episodes in the series i will leave them linked for you guys to check out if you're interested be on the lookout for episode five coming very soon breaking down films number 60 through 51 uh i'll hope to see you guys all there and i hope you guys are enjoying this series so far i appreciate all of your viewership and until the next video movies never say die this is jack burton and the pork shop express and i'm talking to whoever's listening out there Love the war 
together become war. I suppose we have to register you as a lethal weapon. You trying to say Jesus Christ can't hit a curveball? 